I am told that in the city of Philadelphia, there is a wall that contains a piece of graffiti that I think perfectly captures the spirit of the world that we live in. The graffiti reads, Humpty Dumpty was pushed. Now, <laughs> those silly words may not seem significant, but they really are because they reveal something very important about the prevailing attitude of our society. See, we live in a world that is characterized by excuses and blame shifting because people don't want to take responsibility for their own actions. This failure to accept responsibility is so widespread that even Humpty Dumpty is affected by it. You, you remember the old Humpty Dumpty nursery rhyme. I believe its uh, uh, origin is from Great Britain. It says, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. But you see, if Humpty Dumpty was pushed from the wall, then it means it wasn't his fault that he fell. Someone pushed him. So it was their fault that this portly egg man had such a great fall. Now, you may think that this twist on the story of Humpty Dumpty is humorous, but I can assure you that there is nothing humorous about the fact that the world that we live in tends to live by excuses and fails to take responsibility for their own actions. Consider the rise in recent years of so many supposed new addictions and disorders and so-called diseases that view criminals as, uh, not as perpetrators, but really as, as victims. For example, there was a news story a number of years ago about a bodybuilder who broke into six Maryland homes, set fire to three of them while stealing some cash and jewelry. But the judge, when he was apprehended, he appeared before the judge. The judge ruled him guilty, but not criminally responsible. Why? Because his high use of steroids for weightlifting left him, and I'm only quoting now, suffering from organic personality syndrome. That's right. And so, no jail time. Or consider that today, many who commit acts of, sexually, of a sexually immoral nature are viewed not as those who are guilty of lewd and wicked behavior, but rather as victims of sexual addiction. And dependence upon caffeine has actually been cited in some criminal cases as a viable defense for lawless behavior. There's even an ailment called computer addiction. Now, it's not what it sounds like. It has nothing to do with working on computers a lot. You see, a judge cited this ailment in a man who stole computers, and he sentenced him to a year's treatment for this supposed disorder. Now, what does any of this have to do with the Bible, especially around Christmas time? I don't know, but I thought it was interesting. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. I, I, I just threw that in. No, it, it has everything to do with the Bible. It has everything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ coming into this world. See, our generation did not invent excuses and blame shifting and attempts to justify sinful behavior. All that began back in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, the fall of Adam and Eve. Now, we may have taken it in our, our society to a, a new level, but our first parents were the first excuse makers. And as their children, we've been following their example ever since. The Bible reveals in Genesis 3 not only the tragic account of Adam and Eve disobeying God by eating of the forbidden fruit, but it also tells us how sin affected our first parents and how it's been affecting us ever since. See, when Adam and Eve sinned, not only did they become sinners, you know that, they became sinners, but their sin deeply and negatively from that point on marked them and impacted every area of their lives. Genesis 3 reveals that there were certain sinful behavior patterns that immediately showed themselves up showed up in Adam and Eve's lives after they disobeyed God. In, in addition, there were some very specific penalties, curses, that God inflicted upon both Adam and Eve as a result of their sin. And the reason for all of this being important to us is because 
in seeing what happened to Adam and Eve, we see the horrible and the damaging effects of sin in our own lives. When Adam, as head of the race, sinned, he took all of us with him, guaranteeing that every descendant of his would be just like him, a sinner by nature and a sinner by choice. But that's not all. It's also true that Adam's sin guaranteed that in the same way that sin affected Adam and Eve, it would affect us too. See, Adam's immediate experience with sin is exactly what we experience with sin as a result of being his child. And the curses that God put upon our first parents are still impacting us as their children because they were meant for all of humanity, not just Adam and Eve. That is to say, in understanding the way that sin affected Adam and Eve, it helps us to understand what our real problem is, what the source of our problems are, and why, why life can be so painful and so confusing at times. It's because of our sin. It's not other people. It's not our bad circumstances. It has nothing to do with who we're married to or who our parents were, or how they raised us. No, the source of our problems comes back to us, our own sin. And listen very closely. At this time of the year, it is very customary for pastors to preach about the birth of Christ, and well, they should. But we will never see the relevance or the importance of Christ's birth if we don't first understand the truth about our sin. And so... What I want to do this Christmas season is to go back to the beginning, to go back to Genesis 3 to see where human sin began. I say human sin because Satan had fallen before this, but where human sin began, what it, what it looks like, how it affects all of us in order to explain why the birth of Christ was so needed and so important. And in doing so, I want us as a church to appreciate in a, in a fresh way what our Lord has done for us in becoming a man. What he has saved us from. See, we'll never see our desperate need for Christ. If you're not a believer, you'll never see your desperate need for Christ to be your savior. You'll never understand the real meaning of Christmas unless you first see how wicked, how, how sinful you are and what, what Christ can save you from. And so starting today and for the next few Sundays, I want us to study Genesis 3. So you might as well turn there to Genesis 3 in order to see the devastating effects of sin in our lives so that we can understand and appreciate why our Lord was born into this world. For that reason, our study this morning takes us to Genesis 3, verses 6 through 13, as we look at the way that sin initially affected Adam, and it continues to affect us today. Genesis 3, starting at verse 6, we read this. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he eight. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now, based on what we read in these verses, what we're going to see today, we're going to see three ways that sin affected our first parents and the way that sin continues to affect and impact us today, with the first being, the first way that sin affected our parents and affects us is this. As sinners, we sense our guilt before God. We sense that we are guilty before him. Now, in order to understand what these verses I, I've just read to you in Genesis 3 are really telling us, 
what they're telling us took place in Adam and Eve's life, we, we need to take a step back and see what led to their sin. So, if you look at Genesis 3 once again, starting now at verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave it to her husband with her and he ate. Now, we don't need to go into the specifics. We don't have time to go into the details of these verses, but you can see the big picture of what's being told here. It's that the devil, in the form of a serpent, deceived Eve by tempting her to disobey God. But even though she was the first human to to sin, mankind did not fall with her. Why? Because God had designated Adam as the head of the human race. Therefore, as its head, he was responsible for its actions. And so when Adam sinned, All of humanity to come from him fell with him. See, this was Satan's strategy all along. He solicited Eve to sin in order that she might be the instrument to get Adam to sin. And she was. Because that's what we read in verse 6. Again, when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit, she ate it, And she then gave also to her husband with her, and note these words, and he ate. Now these words, and he ate, obviously they're very brief. In our language, they're they're just three words, but they are of paramount importance, importance because from this point on, no one's life will ever be the same. As we say in sports, this is a game changer. See, the Bible tells us that it's at this point when Adam disobeyed God that death entered the world because sin entered the human experience. I read to you earlier from Romans 5. Let me read it again. Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man's sin entered the world, that's Adam, and through death, and, and death through sin, And so death spread to all men because all sin. From this time forward, death and sinfulness became the experience of every one of us. Because as we just said, the Bible teaches that as the head of the race, when Adam sinned, he represented us. He was our head so that we sinned in him. He was representing us. We sinned in him. And as a result, we became sinners by our very nature, our very nature, so that we we now have a natural bent, a natural inclination towards disobeying God and living for ourselves. Now, have you ever wondered why Adam sinned, why he disobeyed God? There is a mystery to this. He was created in what we call innocence. He didn't have a sin nature. God didn't create him with a sin nature. He acquired it. How does that work? I I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us how that worked. It just happened. But we know that that Eve sinned. We know why Eve sinned. She sinned because she was deceived by Satan. But why did Adam sin? Well, as I said, it's, it's a mystery. It's a mystery that even Eve could have sinned, but they had the capability. But Genesis 3 doesn't tell us why Adam sinned. However, in the New Testament, while we're not told the specifics of of even why he sinned, the Apostle Paul at least gives us some insight as to why the first man sinned. It may not answer all of our questions, but it does give us some insight. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 
starting at verse 11. It's a very interesting passage. Here's what we read. Paul's writing to Timothy, who's at the city of Ephesus, and he's explaining things to Timothy about order in the church, how a church service is to be run. He says this, A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. It was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. And in these verses, as I said, Paul is explaining to Timothy that in the church, meaning when the church gathers, women are not to be in positions of leadership over men because they are not to exercise authority over men by teaching them the Bible. That's what Paul says. I know it's not practiced in many churches today, but that's what Scripture says. Instead, the Bible says uh, they are not to be in authority. Women are not to be in authority over men teaching them. They are, though, to be in submission to the men who lead the church by quietly receiving their biblical instruction. And to support his argument, just so we know, this is not cultural. This is not simply first century and, and we've matured and become sophisticated. We don't have to listen to this. No. To support his argument, Paul appeals, goes back in history to creation, the story in Genesis 3 of Adam and Eve and their sin in the garden. He says that Eve sinned because she was deceived by Satan, but Adam's sin had nothing to do with deception. He was not deceived. He knew exactly what he was doing. In other words, his action of disobedience was willful, it was deliberate, it was rebellious. And the point, the point that Paul is making in bringing up Adam and Eve in the context of church leadership and, and church gathering is that Adam, being the man, was created by God to be Eve's leader, not to be led by her. This is what, he, what Paul means when he says, notice verses 13 and 14. Here's his explanation. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. However, in listening to the voice of his wife and eating the fruit that she gave him, Adam relinquished his role as Eve's leader by letting her lead him into sin. That's the point that Paul is making. That's why he was so wrong. Now, we have to be careful when we, when we study this, we have to be careful that we don't misunderstand this, that we don't misapply what Paul's teaching. He's not saying that a husband should never listen to his wife's advice. He's not saying that at all. After all, the Bible teaches that, that wives are, are to be their husband's helpers, and this involves giving their husband wise and godly counsel and advice. And so that's not what Paul is saying. He's not saying never listen to a wife. But what the apostle is saying is that a husband should never put his wife's word above God's word. That's what he's saying. That's exactly what Adam did. And the principle that we need to learn from this is that no matter how important someone is to us, whether they be our spouse or a close family member or a dear friend, we should never, must never, put their desires or their counsel above God and his word or else we are bound to sin. Bible calls putting anything above God idolatry. And it's the very reason that God forbid the Israelites from intermarrying with pagans because he knew that from such a relationship, such a relationship as that, it would cause them to turn away from him by worshiping the foreign gods of their spouses. That's exactly what happened to, to Israel. And not only with the nation, but with one of their first kings, one of their first leaders, King Solomon. We read in 1 Kings 11, now Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord God had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away from their gods." Solomon held fast to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away, 
after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. Now listen, I understand. Eve certainly was not a a pagan who worshipped any foreign deities. But Adam let his wife turn his heart away from the Lord. And the result was that he deliberately and he defiantly sinned against God. And when he did this, immediately the first consequence, the first result of being a sinner began to show up in his life We see how sin began to affect him, and it affects all of us. He knew he was guilty before God. He knew it. He knew it. As both he and Eve sensed their guilt. Notice verse 7 of Genesis 3. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Now, as you recall... In tempting Eve, Satan had said that by eating of the forbidden fruit, he said that your eyes would be opened. He said your eyes would be opened. But what Satan didn't say is what they would see when their eyes were opened. He didn't say it because he is a deceiver and a liar. But now after sinning, they found out what they would see. Because for the very first time, they saw themselves as sinners who had lost the beauty of their innocence. For the very first time in their lives, they knew that they were naked, meaning that they felt shame and embarrassment by their nakedness. See, according to Genesis 2.25, prior to sinning, Adam and Eve were both naked and they were not ashamed of it. But now we read that after sinning, they were very conscious of the fact that they were naked and, and, and they, they were uncomfortable by this. So they sewed some fig leaves together to cover themselves up. See, for the first time in their lives, They're having feelings of shame, embarrassment, guilt for being naked. Not only in front of each other, but also in front of God. That's why in verse 10, we read that they were hiding from God in the garden because Adam says we were were naked and we were afraid. See, Adam and Eve now feel, and I think this is the point of all this, they feel disrobed of the honor and the dignity that had once been theirs prior to the fall Now they're feeling something brand new. They are feeling shame. They are feeling guilt because their nakedness has exposed them for what they had now become rebels before a holy God. And so they try to cover themselves up with fig leaves. That is to say, they try to to hide their shame and their, their guilt by clothing themselves with crude aprons made of these leaves. Now I want you to understand something important about this. That the problem with Adam and Eve and their new feelings of guilt wasn't that they tried to cover themselves up. That's exactly what they should have done. The problem is that they tried to cover themselves up with fig leaves. See, they were right to try to cover their nakedness in trying to deal with their shame, but they went about it the wrong way. And we know that's the case because later in this chapter, in Genesis 3, verse 21, we read that the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothe them. In other words, blood. An innocent animal's blood was shed to deal with their sin. So what God did in shedding the blood of an innocent animal, or perhaps several animals in this case, that was a divine statement on the way that all sin must be dealt with, that there is to be divine forgiveness of that sin. There has to be an innocent substitute who would be punished in the place of another. And the animal, or as I said in this case, probably animals that God killed for Adam and Eve, they served as an illustration of the future death of God's Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who in dying on the cross would shed his precious, his innocent blood as a substitute sacrifice for the sin of of those who had defiantly rebelled against him like Adam. That's why in Isaiah 53, which predicts, by the way, the death of Christ nearly 700 years before it happened, says in verse 10 that the Lord was pleased to crush him. Think about that. The Father was pleased to crush him, putting him, being Christ, to grief as a guilt offering, 
Folks, that's the, the real meaning of Christmas. Christ, the Son of God, I referred to him in my prayer earlier as the darling of heaven. The Son of God was born so that he could grow up to die in order to be crushed by God the Father on the cross as he, that innocent substitute for sinners, died on our behalf. He came into this world to die as a guilt offering for those who, like Adam and Eve, were guilty of rebelling against God. But just like Adam and Eve, at least at this point in their lives, so many people are just plain ignorant about how to deal with their guilt. They know they're guilty. They know they're, they're sinners. Their, their conscience tells them that they are guilty. It accuses them of, of sinning. You, they don't, you don't even need a Bible to tell you this. I remember when I was very young, even though I'm from a, a Jewish family, we didn't have a Bible. I, I, didn't, I didn't know the Old Testament. I remember going into a store one day and seeing a baseball, and I thought, I think I'll just take that. I took it and put it in my pocket and walked out. And you know, right after that, I was smitten in my heart. No, no Bible verses came to my mind. I didn't know the Bible, but I knew it was wrong. My conscience was screaming at me. And I brought the ball back. I wish I could say I always have obeyed my conscience like that, but that's not the case. But in that situation, it was. So all of us know that we're, we're guilty. Our conscience accuses us of sin. But instead of turning to Christ as the substitute sin bearer for us, so often we do exactly what Adam and Eve did. We come up with all kinds of man-made attempts to deal with our guilt. Now, we may not use fig leaves, but we try to cover our guilt with either some type of human effort, self-righteous behavior, like being religious and churchy and doing whatever the church tells you to do, or, or being charitable or doing even deeds of of kindness, or we try to numb our feelings with things like alcohol and drugs and other activities, all of this is utter foolishness because it is a rejection of God's only way of forgiving us, forgiving us of our guilt and our shame. That only way is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Peter says in the New Testament, there is no other name given amongst men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. There is no other way to God the Father except through me. So listen, if you feel guilty, you feel ashamed of your sin, what your life has become, it's because you are guilty. It's exactly the case. And the only solution to your guilt before a perfectly holy God is to trust Christ's death as God's provision and only provision for the forgiveness of your sins. That's it. And watch this. Those who do trust Christ as Lord and Savior, God clothes them, but not with fig leaves, not even with animal skins, but with Christ's perfect righteousness. Do you realize that? That that we talk a lot about the forgiveness of sins, and well, we should, but when you trust Christ as Savior, God takes the obedience of Jesus Christ, who perfectly obeyed the law, perfectly obeyed the Father, and he imputes that to your account the moment you trust him so that as far as God is concerned, he looks upon you and sees the righteousness of his own son. That's the way to deal with shame. That's the way to deal with guilt. That's the only thing that will take your guilt away. If you don't know Christ, I urge you to come to him. Let him remove that guilt. Stop the silly man-made ways of trying to do that. And so based on what we see in Adam and Eve's lives, the first way that sin affected them and continues to affect us as sinners is that as sinners we sense our guilt before God. But as we continue reading the accounts of man's fall, we see a second way that sin affected Adam and Eve and it affects us too. As sinners, we are afraid of God. We are fearful of him. Notice verse 8. They heard the sounds of the Lord God walking in the, in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, shortly after Adam and Eve covered themselves with fig leaves, we read here that they heard God walking in the garden. Now, most likely, this was an appearance of God in, in a human 
form in a human body known as, theologians call it, a theophany, an appearance of God, sometimes known as a Christophany, if we believe it was Christ before the incarnation. So there's probably a theophany, some appearance of God in, in a human form. Now, for all we know, this may have been a daily appointment time when the Lord met with Adam and Eve for fellowship. If so, this would have taken place in the early evenings. We read here it was in the cool of the, the day. It means when, when the breezes started and the temperature dropped. But on this particular day, when Adam and Eve heard the sounds of the Lord approaching, instead of meeting with him for fellowship, they ran and hid themselves from him among, amongst the trees. And there's a reason for this. For the very first time, Adam and Eve are afraid of God. This is not the fear of the Lord uh, that the Bible speaks of. This is not reverence. This is, this is not respect. This is not adoration. This is terror. This is fear. Verses 9 and 10 tell us, Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Now the Bible teaches, helping us to explain this, the Bible teaches that God in his character is omniscient, which means he knows everything. There is nothing that God doesn't know. And so he certainly knew where Adam and Eve were were hiding. He didn't need to ask them where they were. So then, why did he ask this? Because he did ask a question. Why did he do that if he already knew the answer? Because this question was for Adam's sake. It wasn't for God's sake. And you need to understand that whenever you read a question by God in the Bible, he's not asking because he doesn't know the answer. He's asking because he wants others to understand something. And that's the case here. It was for Adam's sake. It was intended to prompt Adam to explain his wrongdoing and why he was hiding. See, God wanted Adam to honestly face his sin. He wants him to face it with remorse by confessing it, by repenting of it. But what was Adam's response? He doesn't confess. He doesn't repent of his sin. The only thing he says is that I heard the sound of you, probably meaning that he heard God's voice calling after him, where are you? And he says, I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid myself from you. In other words, Adam is admitting that he's a guilty, disgraced, humiliated, naked sinner, and his shame has caused him to run and hide from God. Note this, why? Because he says, I was afraid. I was afraid. <clears throat> now, why was Adam afraid? Up to this point in his young life, all he had known about the Lord was God's kindness, his grace, his provisions, his love, his fellowship. So why is he now so fearful of God? He's afraid because something radical has happened to him. He's now a sinner. And he knows that he's a sinner. And the sense of guilt that he's now feeling leads him to fear. Note this. Fear being judged, being punished by God. And so he runs and he tries to hide from God. How foolish. How absolutely foolish to try to hide from God. No one can hide from God. In Psalm 139, David, starting at verse 7, says these amazing words. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven... You're there. If I make my bed and shield, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. And I, I love this. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will, will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. And then he goes on to speak of how God made him in his inward parts. But listen, Adam was right to be afraid of God. He should have been afraid of God because God is holy. God is just. God is righteous. And he has to punish sin. And that is a fearful thing. We read in the book of Hebrews, it is a horrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. A, a terrible thing, fall into his hands. 
But Adam was foolish in trying to run and hide from God because there is no place to hide from him since he's, he's not only omniscient, he's also omnipresent, which means he's, he's present everywhere. Present everywhere. This is why David said that even being enclosed by the darkness doesn't allow anyone to hide from God because to God, the darkness isn't darkness since to him, the night is as bright as the day. But as foolish as Adam was in attempting to run and hide from God and his judgment for sin, people still think that somehow they can run from God. And they often do this by just excluding God from their lives, by not thinking about him, by busying their lives, filling it with all kinds of activities so that they don't have time to give any serious thought to the consequences of their sin and what will happen to them when they die. See, instead of honestly facing their fear of God, of death and judgment, they try to avoid any of this by running from any thoughts of what is inevitable. They busy themselves so they don't have to stop and think about it, or they numb their minds so they don't have to do this. Now, trying to run from God is foolish, not only because it's impossible to hide from him, impossible to run from him, but it's foolish because there is no reason to do this. There's no reason to to hide and run from God. You see, God's purpose in calling Adam in the Garden of Eden It wasn't to punish him, although Adam deserved punishment, but that wasn't why God called after him. His purpose in coming to the garden that day was to prompt Adam, as I said, to face his sin so that he would confess it, repent of it, and be forgiven. In other words, folks, God was seeking Adam so that there would be reconciliation, restoration of their relationship. But Adam, at this point, he didn't want reconciliation because he wasn't ready to repent, so he ran from God. Now listen closely. You may be, if you don't know Christ, you may be just like Adam, running from God, filling your life with all kinds of activities that have absolutely nothing to do with the Almighty. And you do this because you don't want to slow down enough to have to stop and think about the uneasiness that you feel inside of you, this fear that you have going on inside of you that you know You know what's going to happen to you when you die. You may not know all the details, but you're you're afraid of this. You see, at death, you you can't run from God anymore. That's the problem. There's There's no more time to run from him. Time has run out. And you're going to die in this innate sense within you that things are just not right between you and God and that you're going to have to face him and his judgment for your sin, at that point, it will be a reality. One of the stark realities and consequences of being a sinner, which was Adam and Eve's experience, it's ours as well, is that this fear of death and having to face God's judgment is so, is so true in our lives. The writer to the Hebrews speaks of this fear of death as a form, he calls it, Satanic slavery, enslaved to Satan, a slavery that captures and controls people so that they become terrorized by the the thoughts of dying, and it leads to all kinds of bondages, sinful bondages, sometimes even religious bondages, to to just try to escape this judgment. People do all kinds of things to, uh, to try to escape what they can't escape from. But listen, this is why our Lord was born. He was born so that he might free us from the bondage of being afraid of death and judgment. And he did this by being judged in the place of people like us as a punishment for sin. And then the glorious truth is that he rose from the dead. You don't have to wait till Easter to hear this. He rose from the dead to show that his sacrifice was accepted by God the Father. And in rising from the grave, he conquered death. So that anyone who stops running from God and starts running to God for salvation will be liberated from their fear of death and judgment because they know that death now as a believer will only usher them in to the presence of God. Death may be the last enemy, but as a believer, God uses our enemy to bring us to heaven. See, just as God was seeking Adam in order to forgive him, so he's seeking you if you're not a believer He's seeking to forgive you. He he loves you. Jesus said that he came to seek and to save those who were lost. 
But to have him as your savior, you have to know that you're a lost sinner, guilty of treachery, of rebellion against God, deserving of his judgment. But his arms are open wide to you, and they're stretched out for you to come to him. But you have to first stop running from him by admitting your sin and your guilt, and you turn around to him, and you run into his arms, and embrace him as Lord and Savior. That's not what Adam and Eve did, not at this point. Their response to God, seeking them in the garden, reveals a third way that sin affected them, and continues to affect us. As sinners, we have a sense of this guilt, this horrible guilt before God, and as sinners, we are afraid of God, because we know Being guilty means we deserve his judgment. Now we see that as sinners, we have excuses for our sin. We make excuses for our sin. Verse 11 says this. This is God speaking to Adam. and He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Now once Adam mentioned his nakedness to God, he was admitting that he was a fallen sinner, and so God asks him another question. Who told you that you were naked, and have you eaten from the tree that I told you not to eat from? Now, once again, this is a question from God, but not because God is lacking information. It was once again asked for Adam's sake in order to prompt him to see what he had done and how wrong he was so that he would repent of his sin. But what does Adam do at this point? What most of us do when confronted with our sin He passes the buck by blaming someone else for what he did. It's the Humpty Dumpty syndrome all over again, or at least the beginning of it. Verse 12 says, the man said, the woman whom you gave me, or you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Now, instead of taking responsibility for his sin, Adam not only blames Eve, that's only part of it. He not only blames Eve for giving him the fruit, But he really, and understand this, he really is blaming God. He's blaming God because he says, this is the woman you gave me. So it's ultimately your fault that I disobeyed you. It's not my fault. In other words, God, if you hadn't given me Eve for a wife, I would never have done what I did. This is the woman you gave me. Listen, Eve was no better. She was no better. Notice what she says when God confronts her about her sin. Verse 13, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So like Adam, Eve refuses to take responsibility for her action. She blames the serpent for deceiving her. It's not her fault, it's the serpent's fault. So both of our parents, Adam and Eve, tell God that it's not their fault that they sinned. And you and I know As their children, we're just like them, aren't we? We're just like them. See, one of the horrible ways that sin affects us is that instead of facing our sin, humbly admitting that, yes, it's my fault, I take full responsibility, we often come up with all kinds of excuses for why we do what we do. I'm angry because, well, it's my spouse's fault. If she didn't push or he didn't push these buttons that they know make me so upset, I would never get so angry. It's not my fault I can't control my sexual activity. This is the way God created me. It's my genetic makeup. It's his fault. I'm an alcoholic because my parents were alcoholics. It's in my DNA, and this is how they what they modeled for me. It's not my my fault. It's theirs. Listen. It was the American humorist, Will Rogers, who once said that the history of the United States could be divided into two eras. He said, the era of the passing of the buffalo and the era of the passing of the buck. That's what Will Rogers said. So why do we blame others for our sin? Why is this such uh, an obsession, such an integral part of our sinful makeup? Because we reason that if our sin isn't our fault, then we won't be judged for it. That's the bottom line. See, blame shifting is a desperate but futile attempt to avoid God's judgment. It's so futile because the Bible says that we alone are responsible for what we do, for what we say, for what we think. The Bible says, the soul that sins, it shall die. Not the soul that tempted this one to sin, but the soul that sins, 
That soul shall die. James 1, 13 through 16 says, Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. And I I love this. James says, don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. See, it's our own evil desires that, that drive us to sin. It's not anybody else's fault. And we have to make sure that we don't let ourselves be deceived like much of society is. It's not my fault. Somebody else's fault. This is why Romans 3, 19 says that at the judgment, at the the judgment bar, every mouth will be closed that all the world may become accountable to God. At the judgment seat, all excuses are gone. Every mouth will be closed. See, our excuses are worthless because God sees everything, not only our actions and our our attitudes, but you know what else he sees? He sees our motives for why we do what we do. He sees the intentions of our hearts, and therefore he knows what rotten sinners we are, and he holds us responsible for our sin. And our sin requires judgment. He will by no means clear the guilty. But that's why the message of Christmas gives us hope. It's what it's about. Because Jesus was born in order to die as the one who was judged in the place of sinners. There's no hope of escaping God's judgment apart from Christ. So this sense of guilt that you're feeling, then this fear of God and, uh, and of his judgment, if you don't know Christ, all of that can be dealt with by him. Just stop making excuses for your sin. Come to Christ, humble yourself, admit your sin, turn from what you know to be wrong in your life, and trust Christ and his death alone for your salvation. That's the message of Christmas. That's why a Savior was born. And if you already know Jesus as your Savior, just thank him from the bottom of your heart. Thank him that he died in your place and he set you free from guilt, from fear, from excuses, and he set you free from an eternity of endless judgment and wrath. Praise God. Let's bow for prayer. I urge you, if you've never trusted Christ, I urge you to do this. This life is fleeting. It'll be past before you know it. You will have to give an account about how you lived. How much better will it be to say, Lord, My sins were placed on Christ. I'm not condemned. This is what you said. I've trusted the Savior. How much better than to have your mouth stopped and shut and God sentencing you to an eternity in hell. I urge you, trust Christ. And I urge you, if if you are a believer, may Christmas and the birth of Christ the life, the death, our Lord himself be ever so much more precious to you because of what he's done for you. Father, we thank you. Thank you that your son has saved us from our sin. And for those who have not been saved, Lord, I pray that they will be convicted of their sin, that they will stop and think And consider eternity, consider their lives, what their lives have become, and consider that a death is something that will face them as it will face every one of us. And may they be prepared. May they turn to you. Lord, only you can take away the blindness. Only you can can take away the veil that, that keeps us from seeing our need for Christ. I pray that you will remove that veil, remove the blindness, and may some, some who are associated with Lakeside, whether whether they are friends or family members of those who are members here or just visitors or casual um, people who come to the church on a basis once in a while. I pray whatever their relationship is with Lakeside, may each of them know Christ as Lord and Savior. And Lord, for those of us who you've already opened our eyes, may this Christmas time be a time, uh, not just activity of doing things, but may it be a time of 
greater appreciation for you than we've had in a long time, greater understanding of what you have saved us from, the guilt and the fear and the excuse-making and judgment. And may our praise ascend to you in a way that gives you great pleasure. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we trust we'll see you tonight. You are dismissed. <laughs>